I want to do a quick catch up uh, before we dig into 1 Corinthians again. Uh, we're going through 1 Corinthians for this season here. Uh, this is a Corinthian church is founded by Paul, remember, on his second missionary journey. Those of you that haven't been with us, I want to kind of give you some context and review that for the rest of us. And Paul came to him and he didn't try to impress him with who he was and how great he could speak and stuff. But he, he did came, come to them in the power of the Holy Spirit, he says. And um, they were divided into groups. And they were arguing over which group was better. You know, it's kind of like Louisville, Kentucky type rivalry was going on there in the midst of the Corinthian church, if you can relate to that, as to who there was, was their favorite preacher. And they were challenging uh, Paul and his teaching to them because he had come to them and he said that he preached nothing but Christ crucified. So they didn't much care for that message. They thought, well, that's a good starting place, but, but we need something a little bit more relevant in, in our era. So they're challenging him, and um, Paul gets kind of tough with them. I mean, the last chapter last week where we were, remember, he calls them babies. And I just can't imagine... Can you imagine me standing in front of you going, you're a bunch of babies, you know? And that's what he does, is he calls them little babies with sippy cups, and they don't really know much, you know? And, uh, and yet he loves them. He has this great love. So in chapter 4, Paul gives them this lesson in humility. And if you want to follow along, uh, that's on page 8. 71 and those Bibles that are laying around the church and if not everything I think is going to be on the screen if we did it right. So here we go 1 Corinthians 4 verses 1 through 5 to begin with. So a person should think about it this way as servants of Christ and managers of God's secrets. In this kind of situation what is expected of a manager is that they prove to be faithful so he tells him his role, his mission, that of a manager. Now, like the NIV and a lot of the other translations are going to use the, the well-worn word of steward. That's kind of a churchy word, and this translation translates it as manager. I think it's a pretty good, pretty accurate translation. He reminds them that, that he and the other apostles, and actually anybody that's called to share the gospel, and you, you don't get out on this, everybody is called to share the gospel. Okay, so you may not be an apostle but, uh, or, or even a preacher, but you are called to share the, the gospel. He says you're a steward, you're a manager, and that means that we have responsibility, right? We've been given something, and we have a responsibility to share it with others, to, to manage it. And it is, just isn't ours to do with as we please, but we have an obligation. And Again, we are the managers, and to think of it in our secular society, a manager is not the boss. The manager doesn't own the business, right? But the manager is obligated, the steward is obligated to the owner or to the boss of the business. And that's kind of the relationship is Jesus is master and the apostle and everyone else that preaches the gospel is a steward. And Jesus uses this illustration of, of steward and manager a lot of times in his teaching. And uh, it may not say steward and it may not say manager. Um, uh, sometimes it says overseer. But it talks about this mutual relationship between the person and God and how they're kind of in this together, uh, called to share the good news. And, and I thought of Luke 16 where Jesus gave this really uh, kind of it's a parable with some barbs on it, I would call, about the unrighteous steward. And at the end of that, Jesus gave this um, proverb. He said, whoever is faithful with little will be faithful with much, and whoever is unfaithful with little will be unfaithful in much. So the whole concept of the stewardship and the manager thing isn't what we have, because anything that we have is from God. And the way that we use it, nobody has too little to be a manager. Nobody has too, too much to be a manager. Everybody has been given it. And Jesus says, if you're faithful in a little, you'll be faithful in a lot. And the, the world, you know, uh, I ran across a quote by uh, Andrew Murray. He was a guy that I kind of cut my Christian teeth on many years ago. He was, uh, he was a preacher back in the early 1900s, not a contemporary of mine. 
but he did write some books that, that were really hot in the 1970s and 80s. And a Andrew Murray wrote some great stuff. But this quote, he says, the world asks, what does a man own? Christ asks, how does he use it? And that's the whole thing about stewardship or management, is what we're given. How do we use what we've been given? We're not just servants, we're managers, what God has given us. And the, the most valuable possession, as I was thinking about this, of everything that we have been given, the most valuable possession that we have been given as Christians, as Christ followers, is that you know the Lord, and you know what salvation is. Now, that changes lives with other people. And, and that's an extreme valuable uh, possession, and that's what uh, Paul is saying to them, is that he is a manager, he is a steward. So let's go on, verse 3. He said, I couldn't care less if I'm judged by you or by any human court. I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against me, but that doesn't make me innocent, because the Lord is the one who judges me. So don't judge anything before the right time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring things that are hidden in the dark to light, and he will make people's motivations public. Then there will be recognition for each person from God. Corinthians are investigating Paul. They don't think he's doing things quite right. And they're questioning his practices and even questioning his authority. And Paul says, man, I don't even judge myself. You know, because <laughs> who, who do you think you are to start investigating or judging me and my motives? Who, who do you think you are, uh, little church, uh, little Christians, uh, to start to question the way that I do things? Uh, he says, only God can do that. And that's going to be done, he says, on that day. And wow, you know, on that day, he says he's going to bring everything to light and make people's motivations public. There'll come a day, you're getting nervous, there'll come a day when everything that is hidden is going to be revealed. There'll come a day when there are no secrets. There'll come a day when who we really are is going to be out in the open. Does that make you nervous? Good. It, it might. It might make us nervous. There, there are things in the darkness really... I don't want to see him, right? Nobody wants to see uh, everything in the darkness from someone else. Everybody's got some secrets. I mean, it, people, you, everybody's got something that they don't want somebody to know. And, and we, we think of huge things, uh, it can be small things, embarrassing things, you know. But he talks about the intentions, the motivations. And, um, you know, Listen, the purpose here isn't to make us squirm. It really isn't. I know we get a little nervous on this, this great day. But look, look at verse 5. It says, That day when Christ returns, everything is revealed. On that day, there will be recognition for each person from God. Recognition for each person. If you're a person that underlines your Bible, you might mark that. You're going to need that someday. You know, when, when we're going through the... Uh, the kind of judgment, and you think, oh, every, I'm going to have to give an account for every word. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul, for listening to the Holy Spirit and getting verse 5 in there. Other translations say, on that day, each person's praise will come to you from God. Now think about that. It's, it's that great day of judgment when everything that's been hidden about you is out in the light. It's all out there. And then Paul says, on that day, Jesus is going to call you out, and he'll say, uh, would you mind standing up? Because, you see, um, after everything we've seen, not everyone knows really who you are. You go, okay, I can take it, right? And Jesus says, I I've seen you. I, I know what's in your heart. I, I know what you've done and what you've thought and what you've said that nobody else sees. And, and I just want to give you a clap. Jesus, I just want you to stand up, and I want us all here, all of us millions here, and, and remember, we've got eternity to do this, right? It, it's not like he can waste any time on you. You've got eternity on that great day. And he says, I just want everybody else to see what really is going on in your life, because nobody else has seen what's going on, and I've seen you. And I want to give you some praise. 
you see, because you were following when nobody else thought that you were following. And your intentions were not what everybody else thought. That day's going to come to you. I, I, I love that he puts that in here. And Paul says, he says, I'm living for an audience of one. I'm not living my life based on what other people think. I'm not living my life based on trying to please you. He says, I'm trying to please God. And sometimes those two things are in conflict, Corinthians. He says, so I'm living for an audience of one person. And he says, and I love you guys, you know, and, and you can criticize me and you can talk about me behind my back. You can talk, you can post things about me all day, but I'm living for the one. And that's only one person I'm living for because you guys don't really know anything about me, is what he says to the Corinthians. Only God knows me. Only God tells, knows what he's told me to do, and I'm his manager. He has, he has given me authority. He has given me responsibility for his gospel. And so, so you can run me down all you want, but it doesn't matter to me because I'm living for that audience of one, and the day is going to come where he's going to have me stand up, and he's going to say, Paul, good job. Such confidence, such faith. Don't you want to live for God alone? Forget about everyone who's pushing you around, trying to make you into who they think that you ought to be. The popular motto is, of course, is, you know, be true to yourself. That's what our world tells us, is to be true to yourself. This isn't that. This isn't be true to yourself. God says, live for me, and you're going to be happy, happy, happy. You will be. A group of you met on Sunday mornings here uh, not too long ago, and you went through the book um, Sacred Parenting by uh, Gary Thomas, um, and he also did uh, Sacred Marriage. Uh, anybody looking for a marriage book, I would start there. Um, because all the other marriage books, all the other parenting books, they give advice, and some good advice. Gary Thomas doesn't give advice. His, all of his writings are around one theory, one truth, one principle, and that is if you live your life for God, if you become a follower of Jesus Christ, your parenting will be good. Your marriage will be good. And you can learn some things about how to communicate and learn some things about how to discipline children in places. But really it comes down to this, is are you living for the one, okay? Are you living for your children or for your marriage, which would be secondary? I think that's great. Uh, some of you remember the movie um, um, Because of Winn-Dixie. Gosh, we had to watch that in our house. I don't know how many times um, somebody in our family was almost obsessed with it, wasn't he? I don't think he's in the room. Good. Um, it's a story about a 10-year-old. It's a sweet movie. A story about a 10-year-old named Opal and uh, who learns important life lessons about life. Uh, uh, loss and friendship, and her dog is named Win Dixie, and then the catalyst of her discovering many of the lessons. And Opal learns um, that a new friend of hers, who's named Otis, who happens to be Dave Matthews. I mean, how could a movie be bad if it's got Dave Matthews in it, right? And he even sings in it. And he works in a pet store, and uh, he, Opal learns that he's been in prison. And so she sits on the porch with this wise old woman who happens to be uh, Cicely Tyson. And, and Opal says, Gloria, she says, you know Otis, you know he's a criminal. He's been in jail. And um, Cicely or Gloria says, baby girl, come on. I want to show you something. So Gloria brings Opal to that large tree in her backyard where all these bottles are hanging from the tree. And uh, the breeze kind of clangs them against each other. And Opal says, what are all those bottles there for? And, and Gloria says, to keep the ghosts away. And, you know, a little girl says, what ghosts? And she says, ghosts of all the things I've done wrong. And she says, you did that many things wrong? And she says, oh, more than that, baby girl. Uh, and the little girl says, but you're not a bad person. Uh, doesn't mean I haven't done things wrong. She says, but there's whiskey bottles on there and beer bottles. And she says, that's right, I know that. I'm the one who drank what was in them, and I'm the one who put them up there. And you know a lot of folks have problems with liquor and beer and get to start drinking and just can't stop. And are you one of those people, she asks. And she says, yes, I am, but you know something these days I don't drink, nothing stronger than coffee. 
a little opal says, so did, did whiskey and beer and wine, I mean, did they make you do all those bad things that are ghosts now? And some of them, some of them, uh, Glory says, I would have done anyway without, uh, with or without the liquor and the beer until I learned what was the most important thing. A little opal says, what was that? And she says, oh, it's different for everyone. She says, go and learn it on your own. But, you know, we, we should judge Otis, that's the man that was in prison, by the pretty music that he makes and how he is kind to all them animals because that's all we know about him now, right? Yes, ma'am, little girl says. That's all we know. See, God sees all the yesterdays and todays, and his judgment is all informed. He knows and we live for him first. And the judging of other people, well, we're not qualified to do that. We, we can't see everything about them. Well, let's move on. Next, Paul directly addresses the arrogance of the Christians. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 to 13 is the next section. He says, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. I've done this so that you can learn what it means not to go beyond what has been written. And so none of you will become arrogant by supporting one of us against the other. Who says that you are better than anyone else? What do you have that you didn't receive? Isn't that a great line? What did you have that you didn't receive? And if you received it, then why are you bragging as if you didn't receive it? And then Paul gets sarcastic here. He says, but you've been filled already. You become rich already. You rule like kings without us. I wish you did rule so that we could be kings with you. He says, everything that they have, see, it's not a product of your own intelligence. It's not a product of your own skills or your, even your morality. He says, it's all a gift. God has given you all of this. And then he gets sarcastic with them. And I, I want you to take notice here, church family, that sarcasm is in the Bible. And so it is acceptable. <laughs> right? Thank you. Thank you. It should be appreciated. And Paul gets sarcastic. He says, oh, he says, you're already full. Yeah, right. He says, you're already rich. No. You're already kings. Not. That's what he's saying to them. He pokes at them. And, and that's acceptable because they lack any humility. Let's go on. Verse 9. I suppose that God has shown that we apostles are at the end of the line. We are like prisoners sentenced to death because we become a spectacle in the world, both to angels and to humans. And he gets sarcastic again. Verse 10, he says, we're fools for Christ, but you're wise through Christ. No, they're not. He says, we're weak, but you're strong. No. He says, you're honored, but we are dishonored. In verse 11, he says, up to this moment, we are hungry, thirsty, wearing rags, abused, and homeless. That's truth. We work hard with our own hands. When we are insulted, we respond with a blessing. When we are harassed, we put up with it. When our reputation is attacked, we are encouraging we have become the scum of the earth, the waste that runs off everything up to this present time. Now you see the contrast there between the true servant and the true manager of God as opposed to those who just talk it. Because the Corinthians are just talking it. And Paul says, listen, I'm walking it. We can't help but hear Jesus in these words where, you know, Jesus says, if somebody hits you, well, give them the other cheek. If they, they want your shirt, give them your coat right? You should pray for those who persecute you and unjustly accuse you. Paul says that's what we're doing. We're following Jesus is what we're doing. We're just imitating him. Now the next section, the last uh, three verses here that we're going to do today, 1 Corinthians 4, 14 to 16. He says, I'm not writing these things to make you ashamed, but to warn you since you are my loved children. You may have 10,000 mentors in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. I gave birth to you in Christ Jesus through the gospel, so I encourage you to follow my example. And Paul has a very exclusive relationship with these people. He was the one who introduced them to Jesus Christ. Okay, Very exclusive relationship. Nobody else has that relationship but Paul and them. They were pagans. They were at the... Uh, 
the temple of Apollo, if not for Paul. He gets to Corinth. There are no Christians. Paul preaches there for a year and a half. These people come to faith through Paul's ministry. So he says, I'm a father here. Uh, you are my loved children. So imitate me. Now, this is one of those verses that when people read, just skim through the Bible and they read this and they see that, go, whoa, alarms go off. You know, here's somebody going, imitate me. They go, man, this guy is arrogant. This, this Paul, he, who does he think he is? An apostle or somebody? You know, he is one arrogant dude. And I mean, all of our alarms go off until you read it in context. And, and here, he's scolding them about being arrogant because they are. Okay? And he says, follow me. Listen to me. You're, you're going way off course here. You see, you've deviated from the truth. And if you keep on that course, you know, there's, there's not much hope for where you're going. So I'm trying to correct you because I love you. I'm trying to get you back on course. And he's not being arrogant. It's just practical is what this is. Have you ever tried to uh, correct someone that you really love? And... Uh, you know what they're doing is going to cause them a lot of pain. Going to really hurt them. In the end, they're going to be miserable. Have you ever tried to do this? You will. If you haven't done it, you will. And if you start off by asking questions. That's usually what, what we do. He says, are you sure you want to do this? Have you thought this through? And they go, yep, yep, thought this through. Going to do it anyway. So, so then you start making suggestions. Well, have you thought of these other options? You know, you try to give them a multiple choice. Have you thought about these things? And yep, yep, thought about those. So, so then you plead, you beg, and you probably go to bribing first. Can I give you something? You know, try to, try, to, try to pay them off to get them back on. And you beg, and you plead, and they just won't have it. And they go right ahead, and they do this stupid thing. Man, that, that is one of the most painful things in the world. Uh, those of you that are parents, uh, you're going to experience this. I mean, it's just, you're going to see it do it over and over as your kids learn their lesson, as you say, are you sure you want to do that? And yes, and then you're going to weigh, well, is this going to cost them their life? No, well, then I'll let them go ahead and do it and learn from it if you're, if you're really a smart parent. Let them grow up a little bit. But man, it is painful. And we're going to find out later as we get into Corinthians just how um, off track they were. We'll get that next week. Uh, but Paul doesn't give up on them. I mean, advisors give up on you. People give you advice, and you don't take it, and they say, well, I gave it to you once, and you didn't like it. I'm not going to give you any of my advice because you're treating it like it's not worth anything. But you see, Paul and, and God, they, they don't give up on us. It's the way that the Lord is. I mean, there's, Paul's a steward. He's a manager. He's got responsibility, so he doesn't give up on them. And, and it's like God just keeps on trying. Keep, God keeps on sending messengers. We call this in Scripture God's long-suffering. It just goes beyond our human understanding how much he will do. God never gives up. He just keeps trying, keeps trying to turn us over and over and over. God is long-suffering. But you know, it's, I can't help but ask myself the question here. Okay, if Paul says, live like me, okay, I'm going to get in your stuff. Is, is my life, you can talk about me, is my life worth imitating? Is your life worth imitating? Would, would you dare say to anybody else, follow me? I, I, I want you to live your life the way that I'm living my life. Boy, that cuts through all the junk, doesn't it, in a hurry? Is my life worth imitating? Yeah. Do I want anybody really following me and doing what I do? Would I say to anybody, I want you to stop living the way that you're living. I want you to start living the way that I'm living because I've got it. You know, gee. I think it's the first requirement of any leadership. And by leadership, we don't mean uh, leaders of organizations. We mean people on people. Okay. For someone to follow you, we must have a life worth imitating. And it doesn't make any difference how smart we are, our uh, experience we are, or impressive and charismatic we are. The question is, is my life worth imitating? And I don't have to be perfect, okay? But I have to know the one who is. 
and know where to go when I make a mistake. I don't have to know it all, right? But I, I do have to know the source of knowledge and, and know where to get the instruction, uh, how to be humble and how to ask. When we say, live like me, imitate me, we're not saying that I've arrived. But we are saying that I found the path. Okay. And that I'm on the path. And like Paul would say later, he says, uh, you know, the very things that I, I try to do, I can't do. And the things that, that you know, I don't want to do, I do them. And, and he says, you know, I'm not there yet. I'm not perfect but he's on the path, all right? And that's, that's what's important. And that's what Paul is telling them. He's saying, I'm living for an audience of one. He's made me a steward of you. And so I answer to that one. And as I follow him, you follow me. And let us follow together, okay? And then, then someday, someday when I'm gone and you're following him alone, someone else was going to be following you. As, well, as a matter of fact, somebody's following you right now, probably if you're on the path. It's, what a, what a challenging concept that is. When we do self-assessment and we decide, you know, no, I, I don't want my kids living like I'm living. I don't want my kids doing what I'm doing, all right? I want, I want something better for them. I want something better for my kids. Um, the solution is not self-condemnation. The result is that we follow God by following someone else. We're all doing that. Whether you know it or not, you're doing that. We walk in the same path. And the Corinthians are just rejecting the example and saying, I don't like the example, Paul. I don't like the path. We want a different path. And Paul says, just imitate me. Everyone needs a Paul. Everyone needs someone who is just a step or so down the path further than what you are. But someone you can say, when, you know, when I grow up, I want to be like him. I want to be like her, metaphorically. Someone who's not afraid to say, hey, stop what you're doing. Don't do that, like Paul says to the Corinthians. You're messing up. And someone else also who says, even when you do mess up, he says, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> You can't fire me from being your father in the Lord. You can't do that. I'm going to keep trying to correct you because, you see, I've got a stewardship. I've got a responsibility to the one, and it's to him that I'm living. It's not to you that I'm living. It's to him that I'm living. So I want us to ask that today. Um, that's probably enough for, for us to chew on and choke some of us for a while. I hope not. But I want you to ask today. Um, not just the question, is my life worth imitating? That's a heavy question. I want you to ask this question, who's my example? Do you have a Paul? Do you have someone? It, it may be from 20 years ago. My person, uh, I very seldom get to talk to him. Okay? And he's one of my Pauls. And it, it's from 25 years ago, and still, you know, he's my model for life. And I, I want to follow the way that he followed. Okay? And I have some others. Uh, that are more contemporary. But who's my example? Y'all need someone. Uh, we each need someone who is going to tell it to us straight and teach us what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. As deep cries out